All right, welcome everyone. We're gonna take just a moment to let everyone get in from the waiting room. I can take a few minutes on Zoom. Thank you all for joining us tonight. All right, that started to slow down just a little bit. So while we have everybody still, the last few trickling in, I'm going to go ahead and do my housekeeping. Any of you who have attended a virtual author event with the Lincoln Public Library previously will be familiar with what I'm about to say. But for anyone who is new, welcome. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Katherine Hunt. I am the director of the Lincoln Public Library, and I will be kind of the moderator for today's event. Um, our event tonight is going to last just about 60 minutes. Um, we're going to start off with a discussion with our fantastic author, Simon Winchester, uh, about his work and his practice. And we will have time at the end for any of your questions. If you do have questions, uh, the preferred way for you to ask them is to drop them into the Q&A box at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Um, that is an easy way for us to keep track of the questions, to keep track of what we've answered. Where possible, we'll work those questions into our conversation while we're having it. But if not, we will have those at the end. And please drop those questions in as you're thinking of them, because if we have a lot of questions waiting, I will shorten my questions to make sure that you guys all get yours answered. So being able to see that in advance um, is helpful for me just in managing time. For anyone who's joining us by phone, um, there will also be the option right at the end to dial that star nine um, and be able to ask your question in that manner. Um, yes, and beyond that, if you enjoy tonight's event, if this is something you're interested in, please do bookmark our website, libraryatlincoln.org, or register for our Friends of the Lincoln Library newsletter. Those are the best ways to find out about all of the great events that we have planned and all of the services that we offer at the Lincoln Public Library. And for any of us joining, anyone joining us from Loomis, you should also Google um, and bookmark the Loomis Library's website and keep an eye on their calendar because they offer many, many fantastic events. And with that, I am so excited to introduce to you all our author. Like many of you in these author events, I often discover new authors and new books to love, but our author tonight, Simon Winchester, is someone whose work I have enjoyed for a very long time. So this is a particular treat for me to get to speak with him tonight. Um, for those of you who are not familiar uh, with Simon Winchester, he is a best-selling and award-winning author, but also a journalist, a adventurer, and a geologist. Uh, he's been writing um, professionally for several decades and is the author of almost 30 books. Many of you might know him from one of his best known books, um, published here in the United States under The Professor and the Madman, which is a great story of murder, mental illness, and the Oxford English Dictionary, um, which also had a film adaptation. And most recently, he's published Land, How the Hunger for Ownership Shaped the Modern World. And thank you so much for joining us, Simon. We really appreciate you having you having it's you here. Enormous pleasure. Thank you very much indeed. So to get started, one of the things that I find really interesting, particularly kind of looking across your body of work, is before you came into travel writing and narrative nonfiction and the kind of writing that you do a lot of now, you were a journalist and a journalist at a number of um, kind of high stakes places and moments in history. And I'm kind of wondering how that influenced your transition into writing. Well, I, I joined the, I mean, I began journalism in a small paper as one normally does. This was in the Northeast of England in Newcastle upon Tyne and then joined the Guardian. Um, and they sent me almost immediately to Northern Ireland during the beginnings of what came to be known as the Troubles and then Washington and that was all Watergate and then Delhi and lots of things happened in India and then I came back to New York and then I went off to China so it was all over the world really covering a myriad of stories good and bad lots of wars and revolutions and things and to get to your point I think what the journalistic part of my life taught me was meeting deadlines and writing concisely to the length that was required and on time and to the point. So in other words, if they said, we need a, th a thousand words um, by six o'clock tonight, 
um, you know that if it's 6.05, the presses are going to be rolling and they're not interested. So you learn very quickly to be disciplined. And I think discipline, at least for me, and I know this isn't true in an awful lot of people, discipline is a key component of writing. So if I can just go on for 30 seconds more, I don't want to bore you to death. It, it really, if I have a, a book, if I've been commissioned to write a book about a subject and I'm told it is 150,000 words and it's due by the 30th of June, which is actually the case of the last book I wrote, um, it's a point of honor really to get it in at that length on time. Um, and thus far, I've managed it. And um, whether the books are any good is up to the critics to say, but uh, at least they're on time. So I'm reliable. I think that's what they think of me. I'm a reliable author. I was going to say, so your editors and publishers love you. They adore working with you at they, length and on time. I'm sort of quite easy. I don't have many hissy fits and uh, I don't lock myself in my... Um, in my cabin and um, you know, drink myself to, into oblivion. So <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm a pretty boring kind of chap, yes. So it's interesting that you say if you've been commissioned to write a book on a subject, do people often come to you with subjects or do you find them and pitch them or do you just kind of get a deadline and say, give us your fantastic take on what's interesting you now, what's interesting to you now? No, I, so none of those really. I mean, the, the only book I've ever been asked to write, they wanted me to write a book on PT-109. You remember the patrol boat that mm -hmm. young Ensign Kennedy was on in the Pacific when he was torpedoed? But I didn't want to do it because I felt it was just not my kind of book. No, all the, all the subjects are things that I dream up. And what I do is the normal thing, um, which is you, in fact, I might as well confess to you now, I really want to do a book on the history of wind. Um, organizing it into 12 chapters according to the Beaufort scale. So it begins with you're sitting beside an absolutely still pool and there's a cottage with a plume of smoke rising perfectly vertically. And then suddenly you feel a vague coolness on your cheek and the water suddenly starts not to ripple, but to lose that mirror quality. And that's one on the Beaufort scale. And that will lift the occasional seed. Um, it won't do very much more than that. But each chapter would be as winds get stronger and stronger and stronger. So my editor at the moment is very un unenthusiastic, even though I gave it what I thought was a rather good title, which was The Breath of the Gods, which I think is a great title, talk about wind. And um, so it's my job now over the next few weeks to persuade her, which means her concern is that there aren't many people in it. And I say, I will ram it full of people. I'll find all sorts of extraordinarily interesting people. I'll make you want this book. And if she says, oh, all right, okay. Then I will write a proposal. And then it's a serious piece, maybe 20 pages or something on how I would do the book. And she'll take it back to her colleagues in the editorial committee and say, oh, when she's still, he wants to write a book about wind. I wasn't enthusiastic at first, but this is quite an, a good document. And then with luck, if I'm persistent, and persistence is another element of the writing life, um, she will be persuaded and she will give me a commission for X words by such and such a date and then I'll get to work. So I suppose I shouldn't have told you what I want to do because other people will jump in and say, no, I can write a book about wind. Well, <laughs> don't, don't even think about it. <laughs> but, but that's effectively how it works. That's fantastic. So then for you on your side, where do you find your inspiration? Like, so in this case, wind, or I know you have another book coming out soon on knowledge. You've written across a whole variety of, of topics. Well, How to do stick, things catch your interest? Well, to stick with this particular example, um, I was reading, I forget what magazine it was, The Economist, I think. And maybe you already know this. I didn't. But apparently the average wind speed in Europe has fallen by 15% over the last 10 years. And Europe is in the grip of what they call the great stilling. And I thought that was such a lovely concept. I thought I must look into this idea of wind. And then I got uh, more and more 
I was going to say enthusiastic, you might say obsessed. And um, well, now we're in the position that we're in. So I sort of, things catch my fancy and I think, oh, that would be fascinating to write about. But on the other hand, if she turns it down flat, which she won't, but if she does, then I'll just have to keep on reading The Economist and come up with some other idea. So how long is the, I'm sure it varies based on what you're researching, but about how long is your research period for each of these books? Well, I normally try and get a book out every two and a half years, I suppose. So the last book, the one on knowledge, which you kindly mentioned, um, I think that was commissioned in, I think it was commissioned about the time of the beginning of the pandemic. So that would have been early 2021, or was that 2020? Anyway, all I knew was that the, the writing period, I always make it take about six months. So mm -hmm. research until, and, and in this particular case, or that particular case, um, I began writing on November the 1st last year. So yeah, sort of a year and 10 days ago. And the deadline was the 30th of June. So all through last winter and spring and early summer, I was writing until finally I could push my chair back like that and say it's done. I'd like to say that in misery, I had a cigarette vertically and uh, a bottle of champagne, but I had neither. But then I, I didn't crash and didn't meet Kathy Bates either. So I'm glad on all counts. But that's, that's effectively how it works. So about a year and a bit researching, six or seven months writing. And now we're in the, you know, the copy editing phase and I've got to, you can't see them, but these are sort of all the books that I used for research. And I've got to do actually tomorrow, the bibliography. So my lovely wife comes over and helps me. She reads the titles and I put them all in alphabetical order. Then I've got to do the dedication. And then I've got to do the acknowledgements. And the weird thing is in this particular book, it's a huge subject, but because of the pandemic, I virtually went nowhere. Well, I went virtually to a lot of places, but actually I only went on one foreign trip and that was to London, Oxford, Cambridge, and London, and relatively small number of people to thank. Whereas books, earlier books, on a much more condensed subject, you'd find there are heaps of people to thank. So I'm thinking, scratching my chin and thinking, who can I thank? So maybe not so many people. Maybe some of those people who facilitated some of those digital resources that were yeah, that were accessible. Exactly, but normally uh, you look at acknowledgements in a book, and it'd be full of you know, and John and Jackie who looked after me, put me up, and fed me wonderful food. Well, there's none of that. Absolutely. So speaking of travel, you mentioned traveling a lot as a journalist, obviously traveling for research with your current books. What is one of your favorite places that you've been? Well, I have no doubt about it at all. I'm absolutely enraptured by the Western Isles of Scotland, the Hebrides. And you mentioned earlier in the warm up, as it were, to Cork, and I love County Cork. So, and um, there's this little place called Skibbereen. I don't know if you ever went there, but uh, amazing, lonely. I love, I love bad weather, gray skies, seagulls, wind, large amounts of it, and um, coming in after long walks and keeping warm by the fire. For me, no beaches, no palm trees leading and in, leading into the trade winds for me. So Scotland. Absolutely. Well, here in Sacramento, we're getting some of our first little bits of rain and cool weather. And I think we're all still quite enamored with the change from the California summer heat that lasted a very long time. Well, we have the, you've probably been reading about, I think, no, Nicole's, hurricane, the late season hurricane that hit Florida, it's coming up here. So we're going to get, and I've got to drive to Syracuse tomorrow, and it's going to be miserable weather. So think of me. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. Um, going back a little bit into writing. So you're saying six or seven months for writing. What's your writing practice look like? Do you have a pretty committed daily routine? Does it vary? Yeah, well, no, it doesn't vary. I mean, you're going to think me so boring and so, so a control freak, if you like. I put up at the top of my screen, I don't have a word file open at the moment, but on the 1st of November, the top left of the screen, it will say, 
And for this particular book, it was 175,000 words. Okay, you've got to do 175,000 words. It is due on the 30th of June. And that, as far as I can recall, from the 1st of November is 242 days. So if you divide 175,000 by 242, it is a number like 850 words a day. So that is my target. And some days, you know, at the end, I'll, I'll put the figure on this little, whatever it's called, stick it, stick it notes or something. And um, if I'm ahead, then I can sort of relax the next day. If I'm behind, then I'm biting my fingernails to the quick so that I, it's rather like those rowing machines, you know, you row and there's a pace boat and other, whether you're ahead or behind it. And so I'm a bit like that. So as I say, you'll hate me for telling you this, but that's how I do it. No, that's fantastic to hear. I love hearing everyone's different writing process. And I actually really enjoy hearing that one because we're in November, which is National Novel Writing Month, in which everyone's challenged if you've never written a novel or if you have and want to write another to do 50,000 words in 30 days. And that 1667 wow. word count is the big thing they push on everyone. You've got to hit that every day for 30 days. They're very upfront. It does not have to be good. This is just to get people over that, that hurdle of putting words on a page. What a wonderful idea. So you've already come up. I mean, you do this 1667 words a day. So, yeah, it's a national, I forget the name of the nonprofit that runs it, um, but they, it's a national um, kind of writing challenge that goes through. I've managed it one year. I've tried it about five personally, but managed to get 50,000 one time. But it's a, it's a very fun exercise, but it is, it's very much on for 30 days. Can you have the discipline to sit down and write, write the story that's in you? Um, it's a bit like, I mean, you know, Anthony Trollope, I'm sure who wrote all those I, mean, I often think if I'm depressed which is not often there are 47 Trollope books to read and mm. he wrote with a metronome and he would do 4,000 words a day wow wow indeed so you look at all any Trollope book and they're massive but they're brilliantly readable oh that's fantastic and that is that is one of the tricks and one of the things that I that I do think is so enjoyable enjoyable about your work as well is they are incredibly readable. And I feel like we've started to find more and more books that kind of share with yours a narrative nonfiction that is very, very enjoyable, even for people who are more interested in the kind of structure and pacing of fiction. And I'm wondering what your thoughts are. You've been writing in nonfiction. Do you think this is a good time to be a nonfiction writer, to be publishing in nonfiction? Or do you think it's a more difficult time compared to some other times you've been working? I was going to say that's a difficult question, but it's not really a difficult question because I managed to make a living doing it. Mm -hmm. and, and it is true that I don't want to be you know, TMI or whatever it is, but there's uh, the advances have come down from, I mean, I think my high point was about eight years ago, but this is true industry wide, unless you are, you know, Megan and Harry. Um, I mean, they've, they've plateaued, but. Um, 10, 12 years ago, that was the high point. And I think a lot of other nonfiction authors who I talked to experienced the same thing. But, you know, you can live with that. And, you know, I'm now 78, so I don't need as much money as I did when I was in my 60s. I don't need as many drugs. No, I'm sorry, that's a joke. I take no drugs. <laughs> So you mentioned other nonfiction writers you talk to. Some of the writers we speak to um, speak at length about their kind of writerly community. Um, how is your writer's community? Is that something that is a big part of your practice or are you really in working with your own work and doing your research? That's a very interesting question. I, because I was so long a journalist, most of my chums are ex-journalists who have, to a greater or lesser degree, have become successful as, as authors. Um, but recently I was given something that I have not had really for 40 or 50 years, and that's a job. I now have a job. I'm editor of this extraordinary history magazine called Lapham's Quarterly. And I have 11 editors working for me or with me. And um, so I'm all of a sudden part of a community, which is you know, physical. I go in and see them. I go down. I live up in the Berkshires in Western Massachusetts, which is where I'm speaking to you from now. But I now go down 
crack of dawn Tuesday down to Union Square West, where the office of Lapham Quarterly is, and I um, preside over this little community. And it's great. It's completely, they're, they're much, much younger than me, but who isn't these days? And um, I love what they do. I mean, they're, they're editing and selecting texts from history that illustrate whatever the subject of the magazine is. We're working on energy at the moment. Mm-hmm. And they're looking at you know, writers like Pliny describing the eruption of Vesuvius, or we're looking at, you know, Joseph Priestley writing about the structure of oxygen and it's completely fascinating to me. A whole new world. And I've got the key to the executive bathroom as well, which is I've never had one. Ooh, perks. I know, perks, exactly. So what brought you to Laugh and Quarterly? Hmm? How did you get involved with Laugh and Quarterly? Well, I've sort of been, I've known Lewis Lapham, who, as you may know, for many years was the editor of Harper's Magazine. And um, then when he retired, um, he established this, journal because he loves history and think it's, thinks it was a very interesting way to present history. So he started the quarterly and um, the first issue was in 2007, I think, and it was States of War, so a lot of military stuff. And then, the, I mean, the subjects have been so varied. There's spies, there's politics, there's inevitably sex, although it's called Eros. Um, that's, I think, probably the most popular one, but there's death. And, but, and the way you do it is there are three or four essays within the quarterly that are actually commissioned. And so we send out, you know, like you to write an essay on energy or the next one is on islands. Um, but most of the texts are drawn from history. So some readings from the past and uh, obviously with a subject like islands, there are going to be very ancient tracts that, you know, describe life on Crete or somewhere like that in the fifth century BC. So it's, 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 and Lewis, who is now well on in years, was looking around for someone that would, as it were, pick up the torch and run with it or stagger with it in my case. And um, so he asked me if I'd do it. And I thought, what a lovely way to spend my later years, if I can put it that way. But I'm still going to write books, but this is a lovely thing to do. And it's, I think, it's a funny way. I don't want to be pompous about it, but it's doing a, a public service because it is a it's a noble publication, so, non nonprofit. I might add. Well, and that sounds like that meets um, some of your interests too, with the fact that it has had this kind of as a publication this curiosity and this willingness to go in a lot of different directions and to kind yeah. of explore these different topics, which you know is. As a curious person, I think that's fantastic, but not all um, publications or organizations are able to have that flexibility. Are, are you familiar with Lapham Quarterly? Do you take it at your library? I do not know if we take it at our library. But have you, have we'll you ever seen it? I mean, I can show you a copy. Let me just, I don't know. Okay, let's take, let's take a look. I've got heaps of it. Mercifully, I've got trousers on too, which is a, a great um, delight because often I think people with Zoom do it in their PJs, but I'm not doing it. <laughs> um, here's a, f- a few copies. There's magic shows. There is rule of law. Rule of law. Ooh. Swindle and fraud. And luck. So what enormous fun! I mean, I, I, I don't. I'm not here selling you the magazine, but I do think it's something that you should look at from time to time. It's so unutterably fascinating. Absolutely. Yeah. Beautiful cover design. They are lovely. They're all done by a chap who lives in San Francisco. Very Timothy nice. Don. Yeah, yeah, he does. He refuses to come back east. He does it all from the West Coast. Brilliant. Let's see. Start taking a quick look, seeing where we're at with our Q&As. Oh, it does look like some people are having a little bit of an audio issue. It doesn't look like it is everyone. I know my audio is going all right, but we'll keep an eye out, see if there's anything we can do with that for those. Um, so I want to talk a little bit, I'm sure about a book that you're getting tired of ever talking about, but I do know for many of our readers, it is the one that they know uh, are the most familiar that you've written, which is The Professor and the Madman. 
um, which I think is fantastic. It focuses on William Chester Minor, who contributed to the Oxford English Dictionary, but also is about not just a dictionary, but murder and mental health and England at the time. Um, but it's not your only book that you've written about the Oxford English Dictionary. Um, no, it was, it was the first. I then wrote a book about the history of the OED more generally. I mean, the Oxford University Press came to me and said, you've written this book about a footnote to history. I said, yeah, I know it's a footnote. Well, would you like to write the history to which that was the footnote? And it struck me as a, a, a challenging and interesting thing to do. And I love the OED. And, uh, and so I did. Yeah. So, yeah, there, there are two books about the OED. That's fantastic. So the, the fuller one, or the, the more comprehensive history of it, that is the second piece. Yes, um, yes. What first caught your interest was, uh, was it the story of William Chester Minor and kind of his? Yes, I mean, I, I, I tell you the story. Basically, I was writing a book on tramp steamers because I wanted to, I, I don't like container ships, but there are a few tramp steamers, sort of gypsies of the sea, if you like. And I wanted to um, write a book about them. And I indeed got a commission to do it. One day I went and had lunch with the, the then editor, who's not my same editor now, to talk about how, how the progress I was making, if any. And um, she then said, oh, have a look at the books that I'm pub publishing this autumn. And uh, take any one you want. And I almost at random took a book called Chasing the Sun by a man called Jonathan Green, The History of Dictionaries, generally. And I was reading that book. I had a little cottage in upstate New York at the time, and I was reading it before I went to bed and was so fascinated by it. I was reading it the following morning in the bath and came across this section which said, and of course, readers of this book, will be familiar with the story of Dr. W.C. Minor, the American lunatic and murderer, who was such a major contributor to the OED. And I sat up in the bath like Archimedes and said, what? And massively, I had a telephone by the bath and I could remember the number of a, the only lexicographer in the world I knew, who was a woman called Elizabeth Knowles, who lived in Oxford in England. I remembered her number. So with a sort of wet hand, I picked up the phone and touch tone phone in those days. 01144186576767. And it didn't answer and it didn't answer. And I was just about to put it down when a, a rather frazzled Elizabeth Knowles said, yes. And I said, Elizabeth, this is Simon. And I'm, first of all, in case you hear any strange sounds, I'm in the bath in America. <laughs> but do you know anything about this fellow called W.C. Minor? And she said, not only do I know about him, but I probably know more about him than anyone in the world because I wrote a big paper for him, which was published in the Journal of the Lexicographical Society of America, which is called Dictionaries, unimaginatively. And uh, if you get out of your bath and towel yourself dry, I will fax it to you, which one did in those days. Anyway, she did, and I became fascinated by the story. And was amazed there was no book, and then proceeded to write one. The rest is history, <laughs> as it were. And it was an incredibly well-received book. It was a New York Times bestseller, and it had um, it was picked up and actually turned into a film, which I'm sure was an interesting process as a nonfiction book. <laughs> it was horrible. I mean, it was, well, first of all, to stick to the book. The book has a 25th anniversary edition coming out next year. I mean, the, to, to live a book on 19th century lexicography, selling well enough that it's still in print after 25 years, it's pretty humbling, really, for a chap like me. And yes, it was made into a film starring, and you would have thought it would have been a best uh, thing since the Titanic, but it was um, with uh, Mel Gibson and Sean Penn, both of whom who came, became friends uh, with me, that is. I mean, I'm sure they're friends with each other. And it was the most dismal, dreadful, horrible film ever made. So do not rush to your cinema and see it. But it won't be in the cinema, but don't go anywhere to see it. So that sounds like that wasn't the most amazing experience. Are there well, any... It was. They filmed it in Dublin. And so I went over 
And I, I don't want to turn this into a political diatribe, but I, we were, my wife and I were in bed in Dublin, having come back from a day's filming and mingling with Sean and Mel and all the other luminaries and watched the count for the election that gave us Donald Trump. You imagine, well, I don't know what your politics are, but anyway, we were not best pleased. I couldn't <laughs> believe it. So um, that sort of tended to overshadow the film crew. And then there were all sorts of problems with the uh, with, uh, production people. A Frenchman ran the producing company and it all ended up in lawsuits and things. So it was a big mess. So let's oh. not talk about it anymore. <laughs> So you're not you're not just you know waiting for another one of your your novel or your books to get picked up and get to try again with film. Well, odd enough that last week I met in a bookstore. I don't know if you remember if you're a young person, but there was a film star called Deborah Winger, and Deborah Winger's son was in a bookstore. And I met him and we, I knew him vaguely, and um, he said, "I've just read a book you wrote called." The Map to Change the World. I think that would make a wonderful film. And he is a scout for AMC. So you never know. I doubt okay. it. Okay. <laughs> I'm not holding, not holding my breath. But you never know. That's you never know. Yeah. Well, fantastic. Well, so that's Map that Changed the World. Your latest one is about land and ownership and yeah. those partitions. Um, how's the reception to that been? How has it been um, well, released? The, review, the reviews have been very good. I'm not sure about the sales. I never really liked to know about the sales. Um, but it went to uh, hardback. I think it sold out. Paperback. Um, I think it's chugging along quite quite nicely. Um, the I, 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 I don't know. They, the, the, I've got to have, to have a copy of The Perfectionist beside me because I'm sending it to someone today. And I think that did rather better. Some do better than others. I had nearly all of them have been very nicely reviewed, except a book I did on the San Francisco earthquake, which was published in 2006 to mark the 100th anniversary. And I had actually broken my arm falling off a horse and was. Uh, in physiotherapy, de dealing with it. When my editor rang and he said, Simon, you have five minutes. And I said, yeah. He said, well, hold on, I'll put on your publicist. So the two of them were on the phone to me while I'm doing very difficult things with my arm. And they said, we've just seen next Sunday's um, review of your book on the San Francisco earthquake. And it is one of the worst reviews we've ever read. And it, the, the, the reviewer said two things about it. He said, um, I hated this book so much, I wanted to drop kick it across the backyard, which is a great beginning. And the second thing was, if Doris Kearns Goodwin was the Miles Davis of modern American history, then surely Simon Winchester is the Kenny G. <laughs> and so for weeks afterwards, whenever I gave a speech, people would put Kenny G music on as I walked up to the stage. So it slightly damaged the sales. Oddly enough, the reviews other than that were pretty good. And then the author of that review, I've never met him. Um, we shared the cover of Vanity Fair together a few years later with me writing about high-speed trains in China and he writing about a movie called There Will Be Blood. So, you know, life is long. I, 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 what, there's an Arab saying, the dogs may bark, but the caravan moves on. And that's my view about bad reviews, but mostly there hadn't been very many bad ones. Absolutely. That's a, that's a beautiful phrase. I was gonna say, I think one of the things for many um, people as they begin writing careers or try to move them forward is how to handle negative feedback. Because of course, what you write, you, you put a lot of yourself into it and then you, you set it out into the world where it will be read and interacted with by any number of people who may or may not agree. And well, the thing I, I always think is, despite that the Arab axiom is sort of not true because a bad review really, I mean, I've never forgotten. I mean, what am I talking about mm -hmm. 15 years ago or something? <laughs> Those words are etched in my heart. Good reviews, you say, well, of course. 
<laughs> you, you forget that. <laughs> but, but bad reviews, they, they sting. Well, clearly, clearly not enough to keep you from writing. You've written many brilliant things. And I'm hoping you might share a little with us of what's coming up next. As we've alluded to it a little bit, but you do have another book coming out, I believe you said April of next year. I think April the 25th. Um, It is called Knowing What We Know. And it's the history of, or I think the subtitle is actually The Transmission of Knowledge from Ancient Wisdom to Modern Magic. And it sort of looks at, well, first of all, what is knowledge? So that's why I talk a lot about Plato and Socrates and Aristotle. But we move away from that fairly swiftly to then look at how knowledge is transmitted to people. And obviously, teaching is one thing, education, the media. But there's a lot about the storage of knowledge. So early encyclopedias and uh, libraries. And then, of course, it moves on to Wikipedia and and I think the basic, the central theme of the book, once you get really into it, is ever since 1967, which is when Texas Instruments issued or brought out for sale the Caltech 2000 electronic calculator, which at a stroke meant that we didn't have to use our brains to do sums. Because before that, even slide rules and abacuses you could see the mathematical processes. You had needed to know something about arithmetical principles. But with an electronic calculator, you just press buttons and out comes the number. So stripping away the need for our brain, didn't know how to spell, didn't need to know how to spell anymore, didn't need to know where you were on the surface of the planet or how to get from A to B. And now with Google, you don't really need to know anything because everything, everything is at your fingertips. So if we're emptying our brain of the need to know things, to remember things, to do things, what happens to thoughtfulness and also what happens to wisdom and a society with no wise men and women in it strikes me as lacking in something important. So I think the book sort of urges us to put down those phones and learn to read a map, learn to spell properly. I'm a bit didactic, but I don't want to lose the joy of thinking things and knowing things and remembering things. Absolutely. How do we because the world's not going backwards. How do we how do we keep the best of what technology has provided with us without losing things, without even realizing it's happening? Well, exactly. And I don't think, for instance, photography took away anything, but the advances in technology of photography give free rein to our uh, possibilities of artistic expression. But taking away totally our need to be spatially aware of where we are on the planet. I think is pretty monstrous. We should know where we are and why there are hills over there and why there are rivers and how to get from A to B. That's me being a pompous old bore, I'm afraid. <laughs> well, as someone who who works in an institution with the storage and dissemination of knowledge, I'm, I'm greatly looking forward to it. I was very excited when I heard that topic. Super. Um, before we get into Q&A, I guess I'm just wondering if there's any fun tidbits or footnotes from your research in that book that you could share with us, or they're all, all waiting for us in April. Well, that's a, I I love footnotes. My previous editor hated footnotes, but I, I, it's a sheer joy to me to put in a footnote. If I had the manuscript in front of me, I could immediately tell you something amusing, but you've caught me slightly flat footed. (laughs) Um, So we will have to wait, but there are lots of footnotes. I mean, in fact, I did the copy editing a few days ago, and I think there are 85 footnotes, which is a lot of footnotes. <laughs> oh, fantastic. Well, all right. To make sure we don't run out of time, I'm going to start taking a look at some of our Q&As. Well, uh, we do have one of our listeners, uh, Deborah, who is excited about the idea of Breath of the Gods. So you can take that back to your editor that you already have people waiting for it. Great. Um, one, one potential sale. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> but she's also um, asking, 
what kind of the relationship or if it would include some of the conversation um, about that change in wind with climate instability? Well, yes. I mean, I don't want to make this really uh, yet another climate change book. I mean, I, but wind drives the weather. I mean, it is so, this, this is the pitch I'm making to Sarah, my editor. For God's sake, why don't you want to publish this book? Everything, I mean, everything is driven by wind. It's hugely important. And I, I was watching only yesterday. Do you know, happen to know the, the name of the wind in Trieste? What it's called the, the, the Bora, B O R, not Bora like me, but B O R A. And it is so amazingly strong. They have ropes in the streets for you to grab onto, lest you be blown over by this astonishingly fierce winter wind. And um, so she's going to come around to it because it is, to me, so unutterably fascinating. But it needn't be uh, yet another climate change book because there are, I'm entirely in favour of us knowing about climate change, but I don't want to write another book about it. Absolutely. Uh, we've also got a process question for you. Um, Jerry's wondering if you could talk a little bit about your editing process and whether you find you do a lot of cutting, rearranging, um, and things like, do you outline your entire book before you begin? Or does that kind of happen in the editing process? Yeah, no, I, I'm very glad. If I ever I had to teach creative nonfiction at the University of Chicago once, and then also at San, San Jose State in California, and I came up with this mantra that to write a nonfiction book, you need, first of all, a good idea. It's got to be about a subject which will grab my attention, but also the public's attention with any luck. And fine writing is a good thing. You try very hard to write it elegantly. But the crucial thing is organization. It's how, how to get, because you can write lyrically about a subject, but the organization is all wrong and you'll find you lose the reader. So I spend a lot of time and trouble thinking about it. Um, so for instance, this, this book on precision, which is to hand purely coincidentally, the way I organized this was um, to look at things getting more and more and more precise. So when James Watt made the first cylinder for the first steam engine, in 1776, a date which is important for reasons other than rebelling against us nice British people on July the 4th. Um, it was the year of the invention of James Watt steam engine. Anyway, the tolerance between the cylinder wall and the piston was the thickness of an English shilling, so one tenth of an inch. So starting with things that were 0.1 of an inch, and then to point 0.01 of an inch, and then 0.01 and 0, 0, get more and more and more precise. And that was the organizing principle of the book, and it seemed to work quite well. So organization, to this very kind reader or listener, is key. And uh, I would say it's more important than fine writing. And I think that's interesting. So when you first started talking about this, this wind pitch that you're very interested in, the first thing you mentioned was the organization. The well, that was done, done yeah. for me by, by, by Admiral Beaufort in 18, 1805, I think, who divided it from l light air to hurricane, effectively. Mm -hmm. And I was thinking, I don't know if you know the Gabriel's Oboe theme from, um, from Errico Morricone in that wonderful, wonderful film, The Mission. I, I was thinking about that when... This woman is playing the oboe, which is the, apparently the most distinctive instrument in an orchestra. It's the one you can always pick out. You'd think this is the, so many violins and violas and things, but the oboe has a unique and interesting sound. And when she was playing that, that made me think I could write about woodwind instruments. And I mean, the, it's such a wonderful subject. So, um, but the Admiral gave us, gave me the 12 chapters. Chapters, fantastic. Uh, Shannon's got two questions. The first one is: Is there any era of history you've written about that you would be tempted to live in, mm. or at least to visit? Yes, I think so. I, I, I do, except for the toothache. I think I'd be 
be happy to be a Victorian or an Edwardian. But odd enough, Lapham's Quarterly, we, we hold a ball, a gala each year, and I'm the, the chair, so I have to stand up and introduce actors and so forth. And we choose a decade, each gala, which will be in May the 1st, if you, anyone would like to come, I'd pay money there. Um, and it is going to be the first decade of the 20th century, so 1900 to 1910, or if you're a pedant, 1901 to 1911. Um, and of course, we wanted to call it the noughties, but Lewis Lapham, the founder, a very severe elderly gentleman, says you can't possibly call it the noughties, but we'll persuade him, I think because it adds a sort of free song and sort of sexiness to the ball invitations. So that's the period I would have liked to have lived in, yeah. Oh, fantastic. And I, and I think it'll just be the unofficial title of the gala will be the Nobbies. Exactly. Yeah. yeah, we won't print it on anything, but we'll all call it that. <laughs> um, so Shan's also wondering, you know, that many authors um, in our talks and in other ones get asked about how to break into writing. Um, she's asking what you would recommend to anyone on a path to becoming a historian, which I know is a title that you have an interesting relationship with. Yeah, well, yes. I'm, I'm not quite sure which one you're alluding to, other than the fact that the only subject I failed in O-level in England when I was 15 and was history. So I passed everything else, English language, English literature, French, Latin, blah, 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 history. I was useless at it. Um, and became a geologist. And of course, geology is history, just on a much longer, longer time scale. And I think getting into the history of the planet rekindled my interest in the history of the men and women that lived on the planet. Um, and that sort of, I mean, I realized that being a foreign correspondent, you're wandering all over the world, as I did, but you also have this ringside seat on history evolving in front of your eyes. And so I became more and more fascinated by it. And most of the books tend to be about things that happened a long time ago. And I think Shannon was asking about how do you break into history? I think you, a good idea is to find a good story from history. And there are innumerable. I mean, if you would, I have, on the, you won't be able to see it here, the longest book in my library, I don't know if you have it in, in yours, is the DNB, the Dictionary of National Biography, which is 60 volumes of fascinating people. And you, I used to read an entry every day just for fun. Almost all of them, you think, my God, there's a book in there, in that life. And so I think if you just keep your antennae waving and read a lot from history, um, you'll eventually come across a story which just, you yearn to tell it. And uh, that's, that's how you get into it. But it's sort of got to be a specific subject. Um, I, I, I was just thinking of one about the champion Welsh female wrestler in sort of 1780. I can't remember her name, but I mean, there's a great story there. She was a fluent Welsh speaker and was a world champion wrestler. Little woman, about five foot, tough as old boots. And she could throw a man over a, with consummate ease. And I thought there's a book there, Life of This Woman. I think that kind of attention to detail on this, this kind of, Everything is interesting if you get into it in the right way and pay attention to the right points. That idea of each of these lives have a story worth telling. I think yeah. that's a really amazing way for the world to open up for us. Uh, you know, there's always something there if you just find the right uh, way to yeah. look at it. Exactly, exactly. So Shannon, do not give up. <laughs> Let's see. Uh, we do have Donna who is listening currently um, to the audiobook of Land. Um, and is really enjoying that and how land is surveyed um, and wants to thank you for giving credit to so many that have been lost in history. Well, thank you. Now you narrate most of your audiobooks, is that correct? You read them yourself? I do, and I've, oddly enough, I've been talking to the producer because, of, well, I've got to read the, um, the new one in a few 
week's time. He's called Rick Harris. And he's used to be the sort of in-house audio person at my publishers. And then publishers sort of consolidate. And anyway, he became a freelance. But he's so good. And he, so I'm reading and he only has to raise an eyebrow. And I see him through the glass. And I know that means I could hear stomach noise, which is a big thing. Or um, you need to read it again. You slipped up on a word or something like that. But Rick in the winter teaches black and white film at a university in Florida. And he is an absolutely biblical authority on old films. And he, every time I go and read, reading always takes five days. I come away with five titles of films that I always like. And to you guys over there, I will tell you one that he gave me years ago, which I, maybe you've all seen it, but it's called Ruggles of Red Gap. Have you ever heard of it? No, I've not. Go immediately to your film library or the Criterion Channel or wherever. R-U-G-G-L-E-S of Red, of Red Gap. And it's basically about an English butler played by Charles Lawton. It was effectively his first film, who is won in a poker game in London by an American who lives in Red Gap, Oregon, and is a cattle rancher. And so this English butler all of a sudden is pitched into the world of American cattle ranching. And it is so clever, tender, funny, and beautiful. Ruggles in Red Gap. Ruggles of Red Gap. Ruggles of Red Gap. All yeah. right, we're going to have to take a look for that. Let's see. We've got another question. Do you write longhand or on a keyboard? <laughs> if you could see my writing, I mean, you think <laughs> doctors' prescriptions? No. Lewis Lapham, everything is written in longhand and is transcribed by some young lady in the office. But no, I'm very much a keyboard person. And I still have my typewriter over in one of the library in the main house. This is a building separate from the main house. And occasionally we give people tea there and children see this. And they say, what on earth is that? And I explain that as a typewriter. And there's this statistic you may well know that if they did a survey of secretaries when there were such things who you know, would be typing on manual typewriters. And each time they depress a key, that's one third of a foot ounce of energy is expended, such that an average secretary working an eight hour day typing continuously has expended enough energy equivalent to moving a third of a ton of coal. Wow. Probably not true, but it's an interesting thought anyway. You know, I, I've typed on a manual um, typewriter really? a few times and I, and I can kind of believe it. It's definitely a workout for the, yeah. for the hands. <laughs> After being so used to not even, you know, fold keyboards half the time now, just touch yeah, screens. Right. Um, we also have a question on if there's any other book projects you've had, pitches that didn't get picked up or that you really had to sell your editors on. Well, with the exception of the book on tramp steamers, I didn't really explain it fully. What we were planning to do was um, actually buy a tramp steamer. Um, it was quite specific. It was 120 feet long. I think it was 800 tons. It was container friendly. It could carry two containers on the foredeck. And um, it would have, you know, decent electronics and it would be seaworthy. And then a bunch of six or seven friends of mine, we would take it round the world, picking up and discharging cargo, just like a tramp steamer would do in normal maritime circumstances. So we go from London to London or New York to New York, round the world. And um, they gave me a decent enough advance that I could buy the ship. And I found one in the Baltic, um, off the island of Bornholm in Denmark, that was the right price. and. Um, I got all these requests from friends of mine saying, oh, can we crew when you're in the South Pacific or the Mediterranean? And I said, you'll crew when I tell you to. So if it's the Bay of Biscay in November or it's the subarctic, you've got to, you've got to stick. I'm not having you just lying on the deck sunbathing. You've got to... And they sort of said, well, thanks. Not that. <laughs> and then my publisher pulled the rug from under me by saying, no, we don't want 
you have to do that anyway because of the professor and the madman. So professor and the madman, but it's still there at the back of my mind. But now I'm getting really old, so I probably won't be able to do it. So you'll really need to find some people to help crew it, yeah, exactly. you know, especially in rough water. Getting the Zimmer frame up onto the bridge. Yeah, quite. <laughs> All right. And then our last comment that we've got in the Q&A, if anyone else has any other questions or anything like that, please drop them in. We've got just a minute. But um, we do have Carol who's mentioning that she immensely enjoyed your book Outposts, particularly in 2020 when her ability to travel and all of our ability to travel um, really came to a halt and that she really enjoyed reading about your experiences in St. Helena. That was such fun. Oh, in St. Helena. So has Carol been to St. Helena? Because if not, please go. It's the most magical place. Um, but yeah, I, I, I so enjoyed that book. I think the Yangtze River or that book, my two favourites. Obviously, my bank manager preferred The Professor and the Madman, but for <laughs> sheer enjoyment, going to places like Pitcairn Island and St. Helena and Tristan de Kuna, from which I was banned, have been banned. But that's another story. Um, yeah, fascinating book to have written. And it still lives on, which is great. Absolutely. Well, I don't see any other questions. I don't see any. Let's see if we've got any buddy on the phone who's got that star nine to ask a question verbally. I bored them all to death. Oh no, this has been this has been fantastic. Well, the last comment that we have in with the Q&A, just as a quick reminder for anyone who does have a library card, which if you don't, you can get them online at library at lincoln.org. Um, if you do decide you want to brave the film adaptation of Professor and the Madman, uh, it is on Hoopla, which you can watch. So you can watch it for free with your library card. We also do have the book, um, not the 25th anniversary one just yet, um, available at the library, or of course, we highly recommend you always support our authors if you are able to and purchase copies through either our partner, Face in a Book, or bookshop.org to support local um, independent bookstores uh, near wherever you live. And Simon, thank you so much. This has been so enjoyable. It has been such a delight getting to talk to you and hear about your process and about just your insatiable curiosity about our world and how we live in it. It's been a real pleasure. Well, it's lovely to talk to you. And now I can go off and have its 10 o'clock dinner. <laughs> yes, thank you so much for joining us so late, Great especially. Pleasure. Thank you all <laughs> so, so much. Thank you, everyone.